are continuing in our series uh, looking at iLife. And it's been a challenging series. Um, I've certainly been challenged by it. And there's lots to kind of consider, lots to kind of absorb, and also lots to put in action. And hopefully for those of you who have been journeying along with us have found that as well. If you haven't, then do go to the um, website and find the link. All our videos are on YouTube, so you can catch up with them. And we, this week, are on the topic, I consume. I consume. And this is a, um, well, it's a, it's a big thing in the digital age that we live in, which we're considering in this series, looking at how the digital age is impacting the way we think, the way we behave. And um, I, I, I saw this this week uh, on the BBC. I don't know if you saw it, but... Um, it was, a, it was on the BBC website on the 17th of July, and the title was BBC, uh, sorry, PayPal credits US man 92 quadrillion US dollars in error. Don't know if you saw this. Uh, online payments broker PayPal has admitted and erroneously credited, it erroneously credited a man with 92 quadrillion US dollars. I, I think that's in, in pounds at 60 quadrillion. I know it's, you know, it's a mere, mere number. Uh, Chris Reynolds, 56 of Pennsylvania, found the amount when he opened his monthly statement. It was very exciting. But the error was quickly recognised and his account had returned to zero by the time he had logged in. <laughs> Sadly. Um, this was obviously an error and we appreciate that Mr Reynolds understands that this was the case, PayPal said in a statement to the BBC. The online money transfer firm said it would offer to make a donation to a ch charity of Mr Reynolds' choice, the 92 quadrillion, quadrillion US pounds statement has been a, quite a big surprise, Mr. Reynolds said. Um, I don't know about you, but I, that would, I'd like to say, I, I'm trying to even think about how 92 quadrillion dollars or pounds would actually look on a sheet of paper, but I'd imagine it's, you know, some of you bankers make deal in this, I don't know if you ever deal in this money, bankers. Um, I, I don't even know if that's the, that amount of money in the world, to be honest. We live in a, in a world where finance and money um, and purchasing is more and more taking place online. So I want to ask you a few questions just to kind of get an idea, see where you're at. Um, firstly, um, put your hand up if you've ever purchased anything online. Okay, interesting. So there's quite a number of you. Um, interested, who has a PayPal account? Okay, so they're going down a little bit, but still a significant amount. Um, and one more question, I'm just interested to know this. Who has ever gone shopping with their mobile device and compared their price from the, from the, the price in the store to the price online? Anyone done that? Yes, a few of you have done that as well. I certainly have. That is the world that we live in. This world of uh, the digital age and the way that we consume, the way that we buy. And just to give you some statistics, um, of a survey of 15 Western countries where um, kind of online consuming is uh, in vogue and something that is popular. Uh, for 15 Western countries. On average, 22% of annual outgoings on goods and services is spent online, 22%. 95% of online purchases take place in the home, of which 54% are made in the living room, 43% in the bedroom, and 3% in the bathroom. You know who you are. <laughs> Global online shoppers shop for an average of five hours each month. And mobile use is on the rise. 55% use a laptop to shop, 19% uh, uh, use smartphones, and 11% use tablets. And a Dell report um, on uh, mobile devices, Dell being the uh, manufacturer, uh, they found that 60% of people use multiple devices to shop online. 81% of smartphone purchases are spontaneous, 81%. And 56% of uh, use a mobile phone to compare prices in store, 56%. So there you go, you're not alone. I guess as we look at the, the context in which we're in, as we look at this new uh, digital world, the online world that we live in, in the context of consuming, there are new dangers. Uh, the obvious dangers that we might be aware of are, are things like uh, Identity theft. Maybe you've heard stories of that. Um, there's always a danger when you buy something online, whether it be on, uh, particularly on eBay or Gumtree or one of those sites, and Amazon, maybe less so, 
There's the danger of not getting what you thought you were getting or you're, there was misleading information. I don't know if any of you have had that experience. Anyone who's bought something and actually what they've received is just a few of you. Oh, that's, that's quite impressive. I remember once not getting anything, anything at all. I was, it was a few years ago now when Australia was actually doing well in sport. Um, and... Um, and it was uh, the World Cup football, and we made it to the, I think we made it to the round of 16 in the World Cup. And I got really excited, and so I thought, yes, I'm going to buy an Australian jersey and watch it for the next match. Um, but the jersey never came, and it was clearly a scam, someone making the most of the, uh, the hype to kind of sell false jerseys online. Um, maybe you've been affected by that as well. And I think that there is the element that is just a waste of time, that we just spend time online just browsing, looking for things that maybe we would like to buy. And that is a dangerous place. But perhaps what I want to highlight as dangers even more so in the context in which we live is that there's a combination, a dangerous combination of addictions. The combination of consuming, of shopping, and the addiction of internet. And when those two meet, I think we've got a mix for disaster, a little bit like online gambling a little bit like online gambling. So now the danger is that shopping and the addiction of consuming and buying and purchasing is done in secret. It's done in the bedroom, in the lounge room, the living room, the toilet. So the addiction is made private and it's easy. It's easy. We can ju- it's just one click. Amazon now have just a one click function. If you've got an account with Amazon, you like something, one click away and you've got it. Purchased. Done. It's easy. I want to say um, that it's not all bad, too. I mean, it's very easy to kind of go, well, everything's bad. You've just got to avoid the internet. Do not do any online shopping because it's just perilous. Whilst there are dangers, it is worth saying that actually there are advantages. We can take time to ponder. We can research. We can look for things which, uh, you know, for important investments, we can research. We can go online and look at what the best deals are. So there are advantages. I do want to acknowledge that. But the reality is is that consuming and a consumer culture, consumerism is a danger which is exacerbated, I think, in this current age. It's not a new problem. Consuming, as we'll look at, and consumption and the desire for more is an age-old problem. It goes right back to the beginning. But we have new new dangers and new threats in the current context in which we live. And that's what we're going to look at today as we look at James and see what wisdom he provides for us when it comes to this area. How about I pray and then we'll, um, we'll continue looking at these. God, we thank you that you provide us with wisdom. We thank you that you speak deep into our hearts about things that matter and things that are relevant for today. And I pray, God, that you will just be speaking to us. Give us a real openness to hear from you and for us to be really honest about the realities of living in the Western world that we live in with all the things that we have and all the things that we have access to. Humble us and speak to us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to look at three things um, today, three things that kind of emerge out of this this passage. Firstly, there's a problem. James identifies a problem, the problem of pride. Secondly, there is an offer here, an offer of grace. And thirdly, there is an invitation to respond, a response which requires humility. But firstly, we're going to look at the problem And the problem ultimately, fundamentally for James here is pride. It's all about me. It's all about my desires. It's all about what I need. It's all about my pleasures, fulfilling my pleasures. And advertisement is like that. Advertisement works that way. It appeals to your pleasures and your desires. As one banking advertisement strapline said, because you're the most important person in the world. Because it's all about you. And we live in a world where marketing is focused at your needs, your desires, saying it's all about you. And it's a real challenge. And I think as we see here, James, as he goes through, as he talks about the the desires that rise up within us and the pleasures that we desire, I think he is clearly pointing back to something that is worked out right at the beginning. 
right at the beginning in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, at the fall, there are allusions here. Let me read um, Genesis chapter 3, just as verses 4 to 6. Um, the serpent says to Eve, if I can just take you right back here. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you uh, eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. We know that further on then, as, as they take this desirable thing, this, this fruit, they immediately, what's the immediate response? They feel naked. And our consumption, I think, leaves us feeling naked. Because the more that we have, the more that we could desire, the more that we have, as we gather in, the more we realize what we don't have, the, the more we realize how naked we are. You go out and you buy that that. that the pair of trousers or that shirt that you've been desiring and you wear it for a few times and you feel like, yeah, you know, I'm looking really sharp and good, I really like that. But then the novelty wears off after a while and again, you are feeling like actually it's not that special. You have that car, the house, whatever it is and ultimately you feel like, no, there's, I need to have this now, I need to have that. You are left feeling naked. And that is the lie that we believe. The, we, the lie that, that sits underneath all of this is that we believe that what we have and what we can consume will ultimately fulfill our deepest desires. And sitting underneath this again is pride. Pride which says I can fundamentally fulfill everything that I need. It's all about me. And James is hitting on this in this passage. He is saying, hey, pride is at the root of all that is going on here. And it's appealed to in three different ways. And I want to look at that. And I think it's up on the slide here. The flesh, the world, and the devil. Firstly, the flesh. There is the, our pride is, is worked out through the desires of our flesh. Now, it's really interesting looking at this passage here um, in chapter four. First, we have two kinds of words for desire here, and they don't in, initially come out. So the first one is a neutral desire. Verse two, if you can turn to it. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You desire but you do not have, so you kill. Now that word is a neutral word. That's a neutral desire. It's a natural desire. In fact, if we, look to, if we go down to verse three, the same word is used. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend on what you get on your pleasures. pleasures. What we're seeing there is when you ask, you're asking for something, you're desiring something, but you're asking God, which is what it says in verse two. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, so there is this element where desires can be neutral. In fact, they can be good. Our desires can be good. And I think sometimes we just see all desires as bad, some kind of puritanical kind of way of seeing the things which we desire. And, and, and we need to understand that not all desires are bad. In fact, desire is neutral. But there is also another word that James uses, which is um, used the word desire here in this passage. And if we look at verse one of chapter four, this comes out. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Now, that is a different word. James uses a different word for desire there. It's Adonai, which we get the word hedonism from. Hedonism. Now, that means ex ex using excessive pleasure. It's unrestrained pleasure. It's flesh-seeking and it's self satisfying so there are two different kinds of desires here and this is the one where so James is setting up this battle this war that is within us there is a battle in, our, in, in, in the deep place of our desires and the question is what are we going to give into which one are we going to give into because the reality is, is that pride worked out through flesh doesn't just impact ourselves, but it, it impacts those around us. When we 
engage, when we give in to those self-satisfying, self-seeking, hedonistic desires. And I don't, when I use the word hedonistic, I don't just want you to be thinking of Ibiza, okay? Anything that self-satisfies, which gives in to the, to the pleasures of, of the flesh, those unhealthy, unrestricted pleasures, they take something from somebody else. You see this worked out in the garden. As soon as the, the fruit is taken, that pleasurable thing, we see enmity and brokenness in relationship. Brokenness in relationship with one another, brokenness in relationship with God, and brokenness and relationship with creation. The reality is, is that consumerism, feeding the, the, the desires of the flesh in an unhealthy way has impacts on everything around us. It takes and says, it's for me. It destroys relationships with one another. It destroys relationships with our environment. We see our environment deeply impacted by the constant and incessant desire for more. If it's a, a, a battle for, for, in terms of if it breaks relationship with one another and with the environment, James is very clear to say here that it also breaks relationship with God. It's a battle between choosing the world and choosing God. So we see in verse four, you're, you adulterous people, he is not holding back now. It's like, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. I mean, these are heavy words. He is saying, basically, you're adulterers. You're, you are fleeing God and you are choosing the things of this, of this world. You are giving yourself over to the pleasures of this world. And when it comes to online purchasing, this is a real challenge for us because everything is geared to tempt us. It, everything that this world offers, and it is a global market now, is presented for us, to tempt us. It is geared for us. So when you jump on Facebook, when you go on Google, they know what you're thinking, they know what your, your purchasing patterns are. I find it amazing that when I'm online, all of a sudden they'll be promoting things that are similar to the things that I've bought. Have you ever found that? So how did they know that? It's because they're not stupid. It's true, they, they have people specifically who are going through data and are setting up models and systems so that they can tailor information that comes in back to you to tempt you with the things that they think you may want to buy. That's the way that the system is set up. And it's hard. Everything is set up to tempt us, to purchase, to buy more. And so the battle is brought right into our living rooms. No longer is it a battle out when you go to John Lewis or you go and walk down the high street. The battle is brought now into our lounge rooms. And it's a big market. Here's some stats for you. The overall global advertising market, advertising purchase from media sources is estimated at approximately 457 billion US dollars. That was in 2011 and growing to 480 billion in 2012. The global internet advertising market is estimated at about 84 billion US dollars, growing to 98 billion in 2012. And remember, I don't know, for those of you who are here, last time I spoke, I spoke two weeks ago on Google. Remember what the CEO of Google said, Eric Schmidt, he said this, something Google is, Google is something that understands exactly what you mean and gives back exactly what you want. This is the context in which we're in and it is hard. And over all of this, James recognized, yes, this is a battle of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the pleasures of the flesh. It's a battle for affection, the world and God. What affection are we going to give ourselves to? And James recognizes fundamentally and over all this that the devil, just like the garden, the devil is orchestrating temptation. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your struggles. He knows your points of temptation. And he knows how to just orchestrate that piece of fruit just to enter just at the right moment at your weakness. He does. And so James says, 
What? Resist who? Not the world, not the flesh here. He says resist the devil. Now I know this, this might be confusing for some of you and you know, we don't often talk a lot about the devil. I think we need to talk more about it. But the reality is, is that consumerism is a supernatural issue. It's a supernatural issue. And we need to recognize and see, we need to have eyes to see what is going on in the world at large where we see death and carnage, we see broken relationship, and we see underneath all of that, Satan is stirring up hearts of pride, recognizing and understanding that that we are weak in in moments, that in in moments we we long for certain things to fill us, because the lie is that we need stuff, we need this to sustain who we are. In the context of this, in the context of death and suffering, and I wanna just make a note, you might, we may read you know, the beginning and James is coming down pretty hard where he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from desires that battle within you? You do not have, so you kill these really strong words. You know, we might read this and go, oh, maybe he's just being kind of you know, analogical here or you know, he's really not, you know, they're obviously not killing one another. But the reality is, is that is how things work out. Pride leads to death. We can see that in the garden. Uh, Genesis chapter four, the first thing, once they're cast out of the garden, what happens? There's envy, there's malice, there's greed, there's pride, there's death. Cain kills Abel. How is that worked out today? Well, N.T. Wright, um, the theologian, says it this way in commenting. He says, violence and the threat of more of it is the way the world ultimately works, whether it's small-town criminals or large-scale dictatorships. Pride leads to death. But in this context, James provides us with hope. He provides us with the offer, and the offer is grace. Grace. The offer is grace. And I find this profound. He says two things. Um, He says that God is jealous for us and God is generous towards us. In the context of, of pride and of envy and desire, James says, God is jealous for you. God is jealous for you. And I find this profound. There is this deep desire in God for us. He desires us. He desires friendship with us. More than that, he desires covenant with us. He uses the you know, marriage language. He, he desires covenant with us, something that is so deep, something that is so strong. And if the lie is that, that we need stuff to fill us up, James says that grace provides us with something that goes beyond that, which is so good. He said, God loves us. God is jealous for us. And maybe today you need to hear it. I know I need to constantly, daily hear it. Is that, that God loves you? That God is jealous for you? He desires to be in friendship with you. He loves you. And maybe you've never heard that before. Maybe you just walked into church and thought, well, I haven't been to church for a while. And I didn't know, you know, this is all new to me. You see, God loves us so much that in our brokenness and in our corruption and in our shame, he came through the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus, God in human form. He loves us so much that he came to take on our brokenness and our pain. And he stretched his arms wide open and died on a cross to take all the things that we've done and all the rejection and all the the things that we've done to one another, to him, and he's taken upon for himself. You see, God loves us so much. He loves you so much. And this is a generous God. You see, the lie is often that that God isn't good. 
And maybe over time, maybe you are a Christian and over time you, you've forgotten or things have happened and you've been discouraged and you've forgotten that actually God is good and you've turned to other things and you, you feel like you can't trust him. And I wanna remind you afresh today that God is a good God. He is a generous God. He is for you. He loves you. He will provide for you. I wanna tell you that time after time, God has provided in the most amazing ways. I was talking to somebody yesterday who was just sharing their story about how when they placed their trust in God fully and completely and in a financial way placed their trust in God, God provided in the most generous of ways. You see, God is a generous God. So what, how should we respond to this generosity? We are to respond with humility. To accept grace is fundamentally and ultimately to reject pride. I'll tell you why. It's because grace says, now grace is responding to the generosity of God, responding to what God has done for us, Responding to that generosity where God says, I know you can't do it, but I have come to carry you. I have come to give, I've given myself for you. I've been generous towards you. I know that you can't do it, but I can. And I have done it for you. The reason this is so hard is because it goes against our pride. To say, God, you know what, I can't do it. I am broken. I need you. I need you to help me with my finance. I, I see that I, I, am, I, am, I am sold and I'm, I'm stuck in consumerism. I realize that I have far too much. I realize that I desire things, I see things and I want them and I know that there is, there is something about that that is wrong and I know that you're calling me to strip back but, but, I, but I, I don't want to. Because actually, I, I love the fact that I have this. I love the fact that I drive in this car. I love the fact that I live in this area. I love the fact that I have these shoes. I love the fact that I can pay for my children to go to this school. Now, I'm not saying that any of these things are wrong, but if they provide you with identity, if they feed you with a sense of social status, if they feed you with a sense of, of, of security in who you are, and I'm gonna be honest, in this Western culture, I don't think there are too many people who don't on one level or another. If that is where our security lies, then that is pride being worked out. See, grace says, you don't need that. If you come to me, then what you have and what you own is irrelevant in terms of your security. All you need is me. That's God speaking. All you need is me. That is responding truly to grace. But to respond means submitting, as James says. It means bowing the knee and saying, okay, God, I trust you with everything. Humility is the antidote to consumerism. James gets really intense now. If you look at the last few verses, he just kind of goes for it. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse seven says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. You read that and you go, okay, come on, settle down, James. I don't, you know, that was for them maybe, but not for us. You know, that doesn't sound like the Christian life. My, you know, wailing, mourning, grieving, turn your, you know, joy to, la to your laughter to tears. That doesn't, that's not the Christian life. Surely you're not, you know, that's not for us. I think what James challenges us with is the fact that firstly, Christianity is not about happiness, just to let you know. It's not about happiness. And I think that consumerism targets happiness. You wanna be happy? Then buy, buy that iPad. You wanna be fulfilled in life? You wanna just, you know, want everything to go well? Then you need that set of clothes. You need this piece of technology, whatever it is. 
But Christianity is not about happiness. Christianity is about something else completely. It's about joy. And joy comes from something that's much deeper. Joy comes from a security that knows that no matter what happens, we are held by the grace of God. Whether we have this or not, it doesn't matter. We have a joy which is not about the outward appearance. And so I think the invitation for us, and I think what James is saying is, we need to examine our hearts and our lives. We need to examine ourselves. I love what, again, uh, Tom Wright says, the theologian, in reflecting on this verse. And I think this is something for me and for us to consider. This may well mean a time of serious self-examination. Where are all these impulses coming from, these desires that are pulling me away from the God who truly longs to be my friend? Verses 8 to 10 sound to me like an agenda for at least six months of spiritual direction, or perhaps an extended silent retreat. The world will do its best to encourage you to play at doing these things, five minutes of drawing near to God, and then quickly back to two hours of television. You see, the world and its desires and its pleasures pull us. We've looked at the fact that actually the digital age, we are being bombarded and, and not just bombarded, but tailored to. Our desires are being sought to be manipulated. We are in a battle and the devil wants to lure us out to steal our hearts, to steal our first affections for God. How are your affections today? Where are your affections today? And maybe the invitation for us is some serious time for self-examination and self-reflection. So where is the pride in our hearts? Do we look to God who offers us grace, who pulls us out pulls us out of the rat race, pulls us out of the keeping up with the Joneses, pulls us out of having to have and offers us something completely different. And so two final encouragements from James and this is the practical, well, some more practical response that he says. Firstly, resist. Resist the devil. Resist the, the, the enemy who is just wanting to orchestrate temptation and put things in our path. Resist. And for you, you may need some specific help. Maybe there's some of you who know that you're just in financial trouble because of your just out of control spending and, and the, the purchasing that you've done. We've got a money advice um, centre. Go and speak to Jackie. Come and um, jump online because the details are on there. Speak to somebody and say, listen, I, I need prayer. I need help with this. I need accountability. Maybe some of you need to shut down your PayPal account or your credit card account. <clears throat> sort your debts out, your bills out. Some of you may just need to have that time of self-examination. You may not be in any financial problem at all. Many of us probably aren't. We live in a very wealthy country by world standards. But actually, there's something in our heart. Our hearts are divided. They're double-minded, as James says. And we need afresh to have the eyes of God. Say, God, look at my budget. Look at my purchasing. Some of you may just need to um, just have a digital fast. You just need to turn off your digital devices and say, I'm not going to allow temptation into my lounge room. And secondly, James says, draw near. Draw near. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You see, the only way that we can stop believing the, the, believing the lie is if we believe the truth. And the truth is, is that God loves us. He offers us grace, as we've looked at. I know for me, just every day, the reminding of saying, God, will you remind me what you've done for me? What have you done for me? Am I secure in you? Is a wonderful way to start the day. What does the gospel, what does the truth of grace speak over me as I start this day? 
draw near to God, sit in his presence, do what, and you know what Tom Wright was saying, spend some time fasting or spend some time just waiting on God, a significant amount of time, turn the television off, turn the digital devices off and just wait on God and allow him to speak and allow him to remind you of who he is and what he has done for you. God is a generous God and he has so much for us. I don't want you to hear me speaking now and going, you know, everything in this world is bad and only, you know, if we just kind of hide away, then that's good. Hear my heart here, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that God needs to give us a new heart and a new mind to be able to see through the culture, see through consumerism so that we can be prophets, that we can be free in this cultural generation. Shall we pray?